Hi, I'm Nancy Coulter Parker. I am the Director of Content and Insights at Regenerative Rising. And um, I'm the guest host today of Regenerative Voices, Elevating Stories, Activating Change podcast. And today I'm here with Judith Schwartz, she's a journalist and author whose work explores nature-based solutions to global environmental and economic change, uh, change and challenges. Judith joins us today from Southern Vermont, and she's discussing her newest book, uh, Reindeer Chronicles. Welcome, Judith. Great, thanks so much. So the Reindeer Chronicles is the, the third in a series of books you've written. And um, let's see, we have the first book was, I'm gonna put, hold that up, Cow Save the Planet. <laughs> and that's a soil, uh, soil's eye view of the world, right? Yes. And then you moved on to Water in Plain Sight. <laughs> And um, this book was that, you know, explores the land, biodiversity, and climate from the perspective of water. And then that led you to the Reindeer Chronicles, which I have here. <laughs> and so I'm just wondering if you could talk about how, you know, your path through these books and how these led you to writing the Reindeer Chronicles. Okay, sure. So in, in writing my books, I tend to look at what is missing from our conversations, our important conversations about the environment and basically what we're struggling with at the time. So when I, uh, the, the book, um, Cows Save the Planet, which is, as you say, a soil's eye view of the world, looking at how so many of our challenges can turn on how we treat the soil. I mean, it was just amazing just to see how pivotal healthy soil is in terms of, you know, like challenges of biodiversity loss and floods, droughts and wildfires and um, climate change, a big one, human health. Um, so I felt that missing from our conversations was soil. And just and to clarify, you wrote that book in 2013. Correct. So well before we were all talking about soil and carbon sequestration or, you know, as the conversation about regenerative um, agriculture was you know, sort of starting, but um, right. so I mean, back it's very then, trendy right now, but this yeah. was, you know, many years. Back then, no you know, one was talking about drawing down, about soil as a carbon sink and about the fact that when you draw down carbon through the process of photosynthesis and you're, so you're holding carbon in the soil and that's where carbon wants to be, you know, we often think about carbon is this, you know, scary alien thing that's up there lurking in the atmosphere, but, you know, there's a carbon cycle and, you know, a big part of that cycle is that a store of carbon wants to be in the ground, which feeds microorganisms and the whole underground economy, which underground economy, literally of trading <laughs> carbon from the roots of plants. And, and that helps, that supports the growth of plants and our level of nutrition and then certainly carbon in the soil is pivotal for the water cycle, pivotal for our capacity to hold water in the ground, which means a huge amount of resilience in terms of floods, droughts, and wildfire. I mean, if you're keeping a reservoir of, of moisture in the soil, well, then the soil isn't going to dry out as quickly and so you're very resilient to drought you're able to hold water so you're very resilient to to floods and you're extending the season of green growth so the vegetation doesn't dry out as fast after the rainy season which means that you're more resilient to wildfires you don't have all that crumbly plant matter yeah so back then no one was talking about it and how exhilarating to kind of talk about something that's not out there, but to kind of explore and, and discover. And so, that led you then to the, the water piece and this whole idea of eco-restoration, right? Right, so with the water, two things. One is that when we think about, and that came out in 2016, when we think about our water challenges, we tend to focus on what does or doesn't come down from the sky. Mm -hmm. And I observed, particularly when we were talking about the long-term drought in California, which back in 2015 or so, people were saying this is a huge threat to our food yeah. system and all that. 
No one was talking about land degradation, but ultimately you can't really talk about water on a, in our landscapes in a meaningful way unless you're also talking about land and soil and the understanding that soil really is our water infrastructure on earth. <laughs> So yeah, so 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 there was that, and then one other piece which does really lead to the next book, which is that when we talk about the connection between climate change and water, the discussion always tended to move in one direction, which is that climate change will put added stresses on water sources throughout the world, which is of course true and hugely important. But what was missing was the impact that water has on climate and the understanding that if we look at how the earth manages heat, it is largely through water-based processes. I mean, the conveying of moisture throughout the, throughout the, across the earth, you know, ab above us, <laughs> that is a tremendous conveyor of energy of solar energy. That's how solar energy is mediated, is through all the water processes, which are often engaging with plants. It's driven by plants. So that then led you to, um, again, this idea, which is, which is an, an optimistic, or a <laughs> I find more enlightening you know, perspective in, in the midst of a lot of um, doom and gloom on the climate and on, the state of nature um, was this idea of eco restoration, and and you start the Reindeer Chronicles um, with the work of looking at the work of television producer and cameraman John Liu, who was in China, and he had um, originally from I think he grew up in Nashville or you know in the in the um, U.S., but spent time there um, on the restoration or documenting the restoration of China's uh, Lowe's Plateau. Is that correct? And so. And that lies in the northern, uh, northern China in a region that juts up against Mongolia. And so um, how, did you, you know, how did you come about his work or what was it, you know, that, that was sort of a fitting start to show, I guess, to, to paint a picture of what you were thinking about. Yeah, well, I consider John Liu such a teacher in this area because he was talking about the importance of functioning ecosystems. He's been talking about that for a long time um, and often not being heard to such a great extent. I mean, it's a really interesting statement on the way that we approach our understanding of what goes on ecologically in that when he said that he started doing research on eco restorations in the scientific literature, and he found was that everyone was studying problems, but very few people were studying function. And as he says, it's a lot more fun studying function, you know, healthy ecosystems than it is studying what goes wrong. So he had this vision, which was informed by this experience. So I think, so I tell his story because I, because his story informed my understanding and that of so many people who are in the movement to, of, of earth repair. So um, he was a yeah. bit of an unlikely character. I mean, he or, or unlikely, you know, he didn't start out as an environmentalist, but he had been a you know television, a news journalist, right? And then was asked to, or cameraman, and asked to document um, some transitions or, or in that in that area of those plateau. And then I believe you mentioned that there was this sort of segment. It's like a four second segment that shows what happened over is it a fourteen year period? Yes, yes, that, ta that time-lapse clip. Yeah, so, so the basic story is that as a young man, he went to China because he wanted to see his grandmother, who, you know, who was getting on in years and otherwise he wouldn't ever meet her. And this was in 1979. And what he found was a nation on the cusp of tremendous change. So he became a news cameraman and he, he documented like the utter transformation of this society and then traveled all over the world. And, you know, like, like the fall of the, he documented the fall of the, so or, you know, took clips of the fall of the so Soviet Union and Tiananmen, um, Tiananmen Square in China and like these big, big, big geopolitical events. 
And, you know, of course he was on this adrenaline kick and moving all the time and wow, this is, you know, the world is changing and this is dramatic and all that. Then actually through his school, his children in school, they learned about a um, classmates of theirs father was with the world bank and they and they the world bank was involved in this restoration of the los plateau uh, this hugely ambitious uh, project that like is so hard to even grapple with i mean they mobilized like more than a million villagers in applying ecological restoration in this landscape. So a huge degraded landscape. When you, you look at the early pictures and you, you, you see people in dire poverty living in caves and taking their entire wealth is embodied in a few goats and they're taking their goats up a hill and the hill has just a few little tufts of grass. I mean, you know, it was, it was horrible. And the and the Yellow River kept silting up and the whole place was a mess. But the Chinese government in his wisdom said, well, we could keep these people in, you know, government aid on government aid in perpetuity, or we could try to restore the, the ecosystem. So that's what they did. And they had architects and geologists and hydrologists and biologists. They had all these experts and devised a plan and went through some trial and error, but mainly they engaged with local villagers and created the possibility for people to be involved in restoring their old, own landscape. So they, but it was a huge scale. This was, it was ultimately an area the size of Belgium was restored to ecological function. And I'm thinking of these photos that, that show like, you know, like, these huge, huge, huge hillsides then that are broken into terraces. It's terraces to hold the water as when it rains so not everything continues to erode and then they planted on those terraces. And then you see the images of that same once bare boned <laughs> hillside that now is absolutely covered in green. So yeah, so it was really, really dramatic. And it changed. Um it changed John's life. Absolutely. Right. And then, and so then from um, that point, that was sort of like your setting up point that this is not the only example that exists. Mm -hmm. um, and you see, you know, you traveled quite a bit in this through, you know, different places in this book. Um, so the next, I think you, the work, you looked at the work of permaculture designer, Neil Spackman in the Middle East. Is that correct? And, yes. um, and that was a situation which um, it seemed like was created with the Bedouin people where the only way to preserve tradition and sustain their herds was to further degrade their landscape, which, you know, they just sort of seemed to be caught in this cycle. Um, and so what, you know, I guess, could you talk a little bit about that, His, sure. you know, that project? Sure. One reason I wanted to include this project is to show that some of the most successful projects are in the most extreme locations. And that gives us, really offers us tremendous, shows, shows the possibilities there that, that there are. I mean, if we can make it work in these really truly degraded areas in the desert, then we can make this work anywhere. Anywhere. So, yeah, so, so Neil's story is that he was an Arab, scholar, Arab, Arab language scholar and he was invited into a, a poverty reduction project in Western Saudi Arabia with the Bedouins. The backstory here is that, you know, for thousands of years, the Bedouin communities have been living on the land in a particular way. There was a particular ethic that they followed called Hima. And included in this was how they moved their herds of camels and goats and sheep. And the fact that even the most empower, em, impoverished among them would have access to the grazing land. And, you know, anyway, how it's done. And this had maintained the landscape for all this time. In the early 1950s, everything changed. The government changed the way that land is divided up. Or, or it hadn't been divided up. It had been held in common. And then the government said, all land is either 
privately owned or government owned. And this meant that the Bedouin could not engage with the land the way that they had. So that led to greater impoverishment of the Bedouin communities, completely disrupted their way of life. They were, they, they were um, what was built for them were these kind of concrete blocks for them to live in. I mean, these are people who had been very content living in tents in different places at different parts of the different times of the year. So what happened was the land degraded rapidly because rather than this measured way of this land is used at this time, but it's not, we don't overgraze because we need to move there because we understand what the land needs. Then when there, when it rained and there was a green flush, then all the wealthy people from the region would truck in their animals and then they would, the animals would graze and leave nothing and then it was left bare. So, you know, we think that this, an interesting thing is that when, when land is degraded, we often think, oh, it's always been that way. But Neil said that when he spoke to anyone, let's say in their 60s or older, they remembered from their childhood that there was always a place their family would go that was forested and always had water. You know, now the forests are gone and the water in the landscape is gone. So it's really pretty dire. And so since these herders, the pastoralists were not able to do what they had done in the past, they, their culture was still revolved around the animals. So they had the animals, but the, the fodder for the animals wasn't around. So they would buy feed from Australia. And in order to do that, they would chop down their own trees wow. to sell for firewood to restaurants in Mecca and Jeddah. And yeah, so it was just a complete, everything was disconnected. Right. And so, um, so in that sense, you know, the, these two instances, they're examples of, um, just people too, not real, you know, so many people don't realize that this ecological restoration is possible. Right. And, and we kind of talk a lot about, you know, taking from the land, or I think you mentioned to me, even, you know, we think of landscapes as static um, and we know bad things can happen. We, we do, you know, cover that a lot, but just not always knowing that good th things can happen or, or where to start. Right. Um, and with you know, you know, our system doesn't see the value, right, in the, in the ecological processes. Right. That is really true. But I do want to finish, a bit. Let, you know, let's show what happened with, with, with Neil's projects. It was really extraordinary. So we had this, you know, bare land and, you know, like desert in this place where it might rain once every three years. I mean, it was wow. you know, really, really harsh. So Neil worked with a team of local Bedouins and he lived among them. And what they did was they set up, they got plants locally, what is going to be um, adapted for that particular environment. And when it did rain, they captured all the moisture. So they built up a bank of water and they weren't going to use any more than they could capture. And so when, it, when they got the rains, they would plant and they would use that water for irrigation and they planted trees and shrubs and just a whole variety of different, different plants, um, all with a design towards providing food, providing firewood, providing everything that they need, habitat and all of that. So what happened was in 2016, the project ran out of funding. So they turned off the irrigation. Oh, wow. And Neil's reaction was, okay, well, I guess now this is an experiment to see what, what we've done, to see whether anything will endure. And that, then what followed was a period of time where it, it barely rained in two years. Neil went back into the fall of 2019, 80% of the trees survived, wow. which is 
extraordinary. Mm-hmm. And he, he sent home videos, you know, I'm in touch with him. So I watched what he was sending back and there are lush grasses and you, you can see where these grassy areas are in relation to the, the water harvesting um, techniques that they, that they had used. So they were able to transform this, you know, granted very small area, but to show that it, that it is possible, that all, they, all of those trees had a, the trees that survived had a system, you know, trees, you know, we think of trees as these individual things, but trees are really communities. They form communities with the mycorrhizal fungi beneath the ground and, and all of that. So they, that, that process had gone forward far enough so that it could sustain itself through some pretty rough times. Wow. So then, um, so that does lead us to this, this idea of um, just, you know, again, sort of this hope or seeing the, you know, this in these systems, but, um, but you have, you know, you, you, you know, that's an example. And then, and then you went to Norway and that was another example of maybe not valuing, valuing um, these ecological processes. And sort of, we have one opinion of how things should work and, and or how we think they should work um, and imposing that maybe on a system where we're not actually looking at the role, you know, that how, how everything works together. Right. About the value, about valuing ecological processes John Liu has a quote that I'm probably going to mangle the quote, but it's something (laughs) like um, that wealth derives from ecological function, from ecological processes, not the the producing and selling of shiny objects, you know? So, so the wealth, wealth starts with, Photosynthesis. I mean, that's how we grow plants, which are food, and which is not just food, but fiber. So everything we need derives from that essential ecological process. And if we tend the conditions that favor photosynthesis and the production of of life and biodiversity, Mm -hmm. that creates wealth. But that's not the vision that is told in the story of our economic, our current economic system. Right. It's much more uh, based on extrapolation. What we can. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Right. What we can take back, what we can take from the earth. And, and there's a lot of confusion about many ecological processes. I would say that it's a symptom of, our disconnection from the earth that we're in our day-to-day life. We're not observing how nature works unless we consciously choose to do so. And you mentioned, you mentioned Norway and that's a perfect. And you found that, that the, the the animals play a key role in this too, that we don't always, you know, right. Right. That. Okay. So (laughs) there is a fundamental misunderstanding of how, the animals have an impact on the landscape. And the Norwegian government claims that reindeer, that say that there are too many reindeer mm-hmm. and that the reindeer up in the north in the region called Sápmi, which is the, the area where the, the Sami people live. And the Sami, when I was growing up, it was called, you know, this was called Lap land and Laplanders, right. but you know the, the proper name is the Sami people and they live across Norway, Sweden, Finland, into Russia. And in Norway, the government said that they are a danger to the fragile tundra ecosystem. And so the animal numbers must be cut and this meant that herders had to cull a certain percentage of their herd. And so when I was in Norway, this was in 2017, and a case was kept, had, was really in the public imagination. This was this one reindeer herder named Jovset Antisara 
23 years old at the time, he said no. He said, I am not going to kill my reindeer because I can't afford to lose them. I am a young herder just beginning my herding career. And if I, if I call a percentage, I won't have enough to make it. And that ordering young herders to cull their animals really is a way of killing the entire culture of reindeer herding in Norway. So he said no. And he won a couple of important cases on this. The government kept um, challenging this. And finally, at the very end of 2017, the government prevailed. Now, part of the backstory to this, and it's something that's becoming even more of a factor, is that the, that the Norwegian government sees tremendous wealth up in Sápmi, or the district of Finnmark. There's mineral, minerals that they want to get at, there's offshore oil, and there's hydropower that they want to apply in this region. Again, this is a huge region. When I visited Norway, uh, I went up to Trondheim, which kind of, when you glance at the map, it's like, oh, that's the farthest you know, city up north, but it's only a third of the way up into the country. I mean, it's huge. Um, yeah, so I was wow. there, I was in Norway to speak at a conference on indigenous knowledge. And I was speaking about the global ecology of grazing. So I dove right in to this question. Are the reindeer bad for the environment, as the government says? Or is there something else that we're not understanding? And what I learned is that reindeer work in harmony with this landscape. Reindeer preserve this particular northern tundra landscape so just a couple of really quick examples just to, so if you look at the summer grazing the reindeer are nibbling at the shrubs and the small trees that are growing and the, and there's the reason that this is important is that this region the polar regions are warming faster than any other places on the planet and so they're getting more of a growth of shrubs, larger plants that can get a foothold, whereas in the past it had been this kind of grassy heath. Now the grassy heath is very pale, so it reflects heat, it doesn't absorb heat. The shrubs and the trees are dark green, have dark green leaves, and that absorbs heat. So, because of the darker color, it has a lower albedo, that's the scientific term. So the reindeer, by nibbling on the, the shrubs and keep, keeping the shrubs contained so that they don't take over, they are maintaining the coolness of, of the tundra. Wow. And then it's a different story in the, in the winter grazing. That's when you have a snowpack. And the, in, in the winter, they're moving across in, in large numbers across large areas and the the reindeer are pressing down the snowpack and they're you know digging into the snow and they're looking for lichen for for food and they uh, so you think oh no they're they're pressing down the snowpack that's that's bad because we want to keep that beautiful pristine snow but actually the snow is serving as an insulator so when you press down the snowpack, when they're, you know, trudging through the, moving through the, the landscape, then that keeps the permafrost frozen because it's lacking that insulating blanket. And it makes a lot of, a big difference in terms of the temperature. So I thought that was really interesting. No, that is interesting. And, and that is an example, you're right, where it's sort of like this removed landscape where people aren't realizing, you know, I mean, it's the animals have been there forever and, and just that they, they play a role. Um, but as you mentioned, it's not unlike Alaska here, right? Where there are other interests um, in these areas that we're trying to preserve. Yeah, no, it's, it's really rough. The Sami people are facing 
tremendous threats to their way of life because, you know, whereas their land had been considered kind of wasteland, you know, people down in the north of, in the south of Norway, ah, they, you know, whatever, it's kind of quaint, they do that stuff up there, but now it's, oh, we want that. Right. And yet by destructing it, it plays such an integral role in the preservation of the ecosystem, right? Right. And one other irony is that Norway is probably one of the kind of most benign governments. And even so, this is far from benign. Right. So, well, um, we'll just take a pause. And um, my guest today is, is Judith Schwartz, um, author um, of The Reindeer Chronicles, which is here. And I'm Nancy Coulter Parker. I'm the Director of Content and Insights for Regenerative Rising. And you're listening to Regenerative Voices, Elevating Stories, Activating Change podcast. So thank you for joining us. Uh, so from that story, um, you know, you, you traveled and you, you sort of took case studies of places and then you traveled as well. And you were in New Mexico, Hawaii. I think you said you went to cowgirl camp, mm -hmm. um, which is probably a podcast in and of itself. <laughs> and um, you just, you have these wonderful stories about, you know, it's it just enlight it's enlightening in the sense of, of there's so much gloom and doom, as I've mentioned around, you know, what's happening in the planet and, and the climate. And so just sort of tying, you know, looking at soil and water as you've done, and then the welfare of animals and, and people and the people who live on the land and just sort of looking at the possibility of eco restoration of how everybody, you know, we can sort of bring people back um, to these areas and, and improve their welfare. And also, and also deal with climate change because right. I had mentioned that I, I like to look at what is missing from the conversation. And in terms of climate change, what has been missing from the conversation is the crucial role that functioning ecosystems play in climate regulation. And that fact opens up so many possibilities for us to rebuild that climate regulating, moderating capacity. So on that, you had mentioned to me, um, you know, uh, you talked about the void, you know, filling the void in ecosystems that over time, because of what it's climate change and areas heating, you know, um, species going extinct, that things shift. Um, and so that some of these things, I think you mentioned to me, like donkeys in, in Australia, I believe it was, but just that there is also this sort of looking at um, these voids in the ecosystem and that things may fill in to, you know, to substitute for that, that void. And again, that we're not really appreciating or, or understanding their role within that, that ecosystem. Right, right. So Australia's, Australia is a really interesting case study in so many ways. Australia had, I mean, their animals now are fascinating. I mean, I love, you know, to think about kangaroos and wombats <laughs> and all these, you know, really intriguing marsupials. But... Back 50,000 years ago or more, there were all these like huge creatures, like, you know, like the one um, dipraton or something. It's like this, <laughs> you know, a marsupial, the si like, like a giant wombat the size of an elephant. You know, like the, uh, there were all these different animals. And then they died out. No one is quite sure why, whether it was an ecological change or... Um, that aboriginal, aboriginal people hunted them to extinction or a combination of both. So the way that, that um, Australia has, a, like the last 50,000 years, Australia has kind of evolved without these animals and it has very poor soil and it has um, a kind of a fire ecology. A lot of their, mm -hmm. their plants are um, fire dependent like eucalyptus. So, you know, it has, it has all these different dynamics going on. So um, there are these wild donkeys. So back when um, the person that I've been following named Chris Hengler is in Western Australia. I mean, you could think of like the outback of the outback. This guy <laughs> manages an area of land the size of the five boroughs of New York. Wow. And his product is restored landscapes. That is what he's doing. He is wow. trying to 
make this piece of the earth better and more functional. And he does that mostly with cattle. So in that part of Australia, in the late 1800s, people brought in donkeys as pack animals. So, you know, they were moving things across large areas and getting the railway going and all, all that stuff. So after they no longer needed the donkeys because motorized vehicles came into, became available and also donkeys had happened to live a long time, upwards of 40 <laughs> years. And so like if someone's done with them, you know, they just let them go. So this created a situation where you have these bands of wild donkeys just kind of roaming around and you know they're very clever creatures and they kind of you know found their way and this and that and the government considers them pests to the point where they are trying to eradicate them wow i mean like get them right. out of there mm -hmm. and um yeah there's some very very cruel programs to do that it's really really distressing when you understand you know that these are very intelligent social animals so chris hengler saw that there was another way to understand how these donkeys are interacting in the environment and specifically he saw them as tools for fire management because they browse so so cattle you know he's working with cattle and one of the things that he's doing is making the the land more fire resilient by working with the cattle so that they are helping to regenerate the landscape bringing added moisture and fertility so that plants are growing and so that the the sea, the dry season doesn't happen so quickly so that there the, there's moisture in the landscape longer into the dry season you know all those different things that and creating better biodiversity by moving seeds around and pressing seeds in and pressing the dried plant matter into the soil to be, so that it doesn't become fire fuel. So there are areas where the cattle won't go, but the donkeys are very happy. And the donkeys um, are browsing on all this brush that otherwise would need to be recycled in another way and the way that nature does that is through fire so mm -hmm. it's kind of a choice like do you recycle this plant matter through the you know biologically through the digestive processes of animals which has lots of other um, ecological implications of transferring seeds and adding fertility to the soil and all of that or let it be fire fuel so he believes that these wild donkeys are are allies to a huge extent but the very narrow way of thinking about this, these animals are oh but they're not from australia so we can't have them right. as opposed to looking in terms of function they're filling an ecological niche that isn't that is not otherwise being filled right and that's needed right well so then you um and, and I guess that you touched on that as well a little bit with me uh, when you went to cowgirl camp. Was that in Washington? Yes, in eastern Washington state at the Lazy R Ranch. Okay. And I think um, just that idea too, again, of what the role, you know, animals do play and, and whether it's cattle or, you know, that we tend to, um, there's, you know, there's clearly different movements that have been going on on that front, but just that, that key role of them um, working the land, right? Right. Right. And so I had been writing about this for a long time, but I hadn't implemented it myself. And actually that summer for an experiment, we got a mini flock of sheep. So I learned how to move animals on the land. And, you know, of course it was quite comical. We, you know, us with our, our fence, you know, our fence, fence moving and figuring it all out. But what I hadn't expected was just how much, how much I loved being around the animals and, you know, and that's real too. You know, when people are working with animals, it's very, very rewarding in part because of just, you know, we, we are of <laughs> nature and, you know, uh, uh, humans have always been interacting with animals. And so at the new cowgirl camp, 
one, one reason, well, what I wrote about was about the role of women in regenerative agriculture and how women are coming to the fore and, and putting together the links between what they desire, which is healthier landscapes, healthier food for their children in their communities and saying, I want to, I, I'm up for this. So I was at camp with, I guess there were about 10 of us and there, I was so impressed. There were young women who were planning on starting ranches and they have, and I see them on Instagram with their animals and, and what they're doing. And it is, it is beautiful and rewarding work. And with so many implications from the food security, providing food and nurturing and stewarding the land and helping it become more beautiful and vibrant. And yeah, and then also the point about women in regenerative agriculture to understand that in much of the world, women are tending the land, saving the seeds and caring for their families and community, feeding their families and communities. Mm -hmm. Whereas we tend to think of a farmer as a guy with a tractor, but there are many ways to grow food and yeah, women are doing much more of this than, than we really tend to appreciate. Well, and that brings um, up the point that we talked about as far as the community around all of this, right? And so I think what um, you, know, you had touched on in our conversations where people being like the Bedouin people in the Middle East or you know, being pushed um, out of your community or sort of into these jobs or places that feel foreign and you're not on the land. Um, you might be on the outskirts of a city or, you know, sort of we, by degrading the land or losing these places, we also lose community. Um, and that sort of like, that brings us to Spain where, you know, you were witnessing or, or you know, visited the areas where there is that attempt also to sort of bring, um, regenerate the land, but also create sort of that business infrastructure around it. Yeah, yeah. So, so I went to Spain for a few different reasons. One was to see the work of a company called Common Land. And this is a company actually that John Liu had played a role in, that he inspired the founder of Common Land, a Dutch person named Willem Feverda, to develop this concept. So Willem used many of the insights that John had developed through his study of ecological restoration. So the goal of Common Land is to create a business case for restoring land. So just for an example, they it, it, at Common Land, and so they began with four landscapes. I mean, they're very, very methodical and take a lot of time. They have eight landscapes now. The first, I think the first, first or second was the one in Spain. But when, in their model, they look at the landscape as three zones. So there's an ecological zone, which is not touched. That is for nature. There's an economic zone, and that's for business. There's a mixed zone, which applies to both. So it could be recreation areas, residences, um, agroforestry projects, something like that. But one of the insights is that by having a natural zone, land that is not touched, it actually allows the economic zone to be more productive. By having land that is natural or as close to natural as it can be, it, it serves many functions. It, it creates more opportunities for healthy pollinator populations. For It just having a, enough land that is healthy allows the rest of the land to be more productive. And so you said people were there, this, this project was bringing younger people back to the area and they are presenting, is it business ideas or ways to, um, you know, idea, initiatives to work in that community? Yeah. 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 So, so they, what they did was in, in Spain, 
there's a region on the high plains in the south of Spain it crosses several different different provinces. So Murcia and anyway, a few of them. Um, <laughs> Granada, it, it's, it's a lot. And so this was an area that was losing population. The farms were going under and being abandoned. It was emptying out the soil. It was very high mineral soil, but it just had no life in it. Mm -hmm. And so young people there who grew up there, they, if they wanted any future, they left. So it was kind of, you know, some places kind of become just abandoned to the older people who just don't have the initiative to leave. Right. So, but, but they saw the common land team saw potential in this area because there were some farmers who were very forward thinking and were trying to work ecologically and had a, were so committed to this land that their families had been in for centuries. So they common land created a community organization called all the law and through that, hosted many events and a lot of education around regenerative agriculture and kind of created this whole possibility of doing work. And what they did, they chose to focus on a particular kind of landscape based around almond production. This region has the, the most, um, it's the, has the most rain fed almond production of anywhere in the world. So what they did was working ecologically, they integrated the almond production with growing cover that's herbs. So they had, so the creation of essential oils from lavender and thyme and sage. And so whatever grows well there. Mm -hmm. Then they also integrated sheep herding because bringing back sheep that are indigenous to that area then the sheep are grazing around the vegetation around the trees fertilizing the area and offering another layer of something to to sell and to build wealth upon so um you know so a whole system of the almond ecosystem, um, and and so they they've been working on that, and they have some very dynamic people involved. One of the people who was putting together that model is a woman named um, I'm forgetting her her first name Vargas. Um, she she's a biologist who was instrumental in bringing back the Iberian lynx. Oh, wow. And so, th so there's all this dynamism happening and with their, all the different products and there's wine production in the region too, that can, uh, that can be integrated with livestock and, you know, all of these different programs, they look at four returns, unlike many businesses, which is all about, you know, the, the yield of product and income and profit. They have four returns, return of nature, return of capital of profit return of social capital or community right and return of inspiration which is that ineffable spirit of we have something to live for and our mm -hmm. our lives on this land have meaning and that has become infectious for many young people who thought that they had left the area for good and so they're becoming spokespeople for these pro the projects. They're becoming planners and developing composting programs and just building up the many layers of this whole econ new economy. Was including, that, was that, yeah. Was that related to the camps that John Liu does? Or is yeah. that separate? So it, both. Okay. Both. The way that it's connected is that one of the farmers who's involved, who's part of the, the Alvalal common land project mm -hmm. learned about the ecosystem restoration camp model. And this is something, excuse me, that John Liu has been talking about for a number of years, which is he's 
his belief was, we know we need to restore the, excuse me, the world's ecosystems, but we need, so we need pe people who know how to do this. So how do we train people mm -hmm. in the art of earth repair? And so he decided that we should have all over the world, wherever we are invited to have set camps, places where people live temporarily, work together, make art, you know, <laughs> John's very <laughs> idealistic, you know, um, make art, feed ourselves, learn, work with the food and plants that, that grow there and, and restore the land, restore the biodiversity and the soil and the, all of this. So all around the globe. So this, this farmer, this young farmer who moved back from Madrid, he said, you know, I have enough land. I, I have a patch of about five hectares, which is about 12 acres. And you guys can use this. So thus Camp Altiplano, the first ecosystem restoration camp was born. Wow. So you've seen, so, you know, through this, you're, you've seen all these, you know, this growing co cohort of scientists and mavericks and, and young people who are sort of shifting, you know, to this, this way of thinking and aligning with nature. Um, is there sort of a, a personality type that you see in this? You know, it's not, you know, is it, or it's just every, you know, there's sort of people come to it from all different angles, it seems. Yeah, from all different angles. Some people have been in agriculture and find that our model of agriculture doesn't work. Uh, some people through food, through improving their diets, realize that how things are grown makes a huge difference in their own health and therefore they get involved. They start looking at soil, they start looking at how do we make healthy soil, all of that. A lot of people in the realm of permaculture, which is a very, um, it's a, a, a way of approaching the land in a way that serves human humanity and all of life, you know, all of, you know, like wildlife and all, all plants um, in, a, in a way through a lens of design and certain principles and ethics. And it's a very kind of can-do approach, just very, you know, roll up your sleeves, problem solving um, approach. So that's many people from that area are drawn to this. Also, people who are just had enough of, of despair and helplessness okay. and just say, aha, this is a way to get involved. This is a way to be, rather than rue the problem, to be part of the solution. Okay. And yeah. You said that, I think, you know, yeah, that we are, we are all connected to our watersheds or our, you know, food sheds. And um, I think you had said to me, you know, the, the reality is, you know, we, we tend to think, we think things are on a screen or that's somewhere else or, you know, um, and we just forget what we can do on the ground or where, you know, right where we are. Um, and I think you, I, I thought it was interesting. You, you had a quote in just at the start of the book that was, we have no choice but to accept the unknown as uncomfortable as it is. And I thought, well, that's very interesting during this time of COVID, but also just with the land of just being, but really sort of being able to, um, instead of setting on an idea that this is how it is, or it's degraded and it's done, you know, what are the possibilities? Uh, and I think it was very interesting just to see, you know, in this book, outlining these examples of what people, I guess, people seeing the land in front of them um, mm -hmm. and where they are mm -hmm. instead of looking for some other place to restore, you know, sort of really right. taking a chance on that, on that area. Right. And that is one of the really exciting things about the, the eco restoration camp movement is that there are people who are going to other landscapes, you know, I mean, we all want to check out what it's like in another corner of the world. And we all, you know, one learns an incredible amount from that. But then there are also people who are setting up camps in their own regions. Perhaps they need some help. Perhaps they want to, they, they're, they want to share what's possible in say a tropical environment or, um, you know, in Bolivia, there are, are also certain challenges that they have. I just want to mention that when I went to the ecosystem res restoration camp, Camp Altiplano in Spain, that was there were that was one of two functioning, you know, like two camps. It was just beginning. 
Now there are more than 20, wow. including several in California. And one in California, Camp Paradise, is, was developed in the aftermath of the horrible fires in 2018 in Butte County, when the town of Paradise burnt up. Right. I mean, it was horrible, you know, that was involving, you know, the huge brush wildfires, but also the decisions made by um, PG&E, the electric company. Mm -hmm. So, but it, it was really devastating. And rather than waiting for someone to, for the government to come in and help or whatever, a group of people said, well, here we have an opportunity to learn on site in the moment how best to restore a landscape after fire. Wow. And that's and still ongoing, right? So that's, yeah, those are skills that can continue. Yeah. Um, well, what, I guess from, what is your, you know, sort of ultimate takeaway or what's, you know, or what's next? Like, where does this lead you now or on your... Wow. Well, right now I'm all about sharing this, sharing this understanding that we have so much agency in terms of how our landscapes function and, and that, that, that matters, that matters everywhere. It can start small in your land. I mean, even, you know, even just little changes on our land. I added another garden with a lot of, um, a lot of flowers and the number of pollinators mm -hmm. that come here. I mean, you know, I can say, yay, isn't that great? We have more beautiful butterflies, but that butterfly, those butterflies are stopping here, then they're going somewhere else. And they're, and, and just, we are all connected. I mean, if there's another thing that our, that the pandemic has taught us is that there is no elsewhere that doesn't be, you know, doesn't touch us. Right. So every bit of the earth that we can enhance how it functions, that matters. You know, someone up the hill from me, if they work on their watershed, that means less runoff on the mountain, less, um, you know, just less work that has to be done on the roads constantly, less right. flow of silting up into the streams, whatever we can do. So that's the small scale. And then the large scale we saw in, on the Los Plateau. And that's a huge canvas, but they, but I mean, more than 2 million people were brought out of poverty, not by handing them money, but by helping them to heal the, the earth. So yeah, there's so many possibilities. I was going to say the story of possibility. <laughs> Well, thank you for, for sharing uh, with us today. And um, our guest has been Judith Schwartz, and she's the author of The Reindeer Chronicles, amongst other books. <laughs> and I'm Nancy Coulter Parker, the Director of Content and Insights at Regenerative Rising. And you've been listening to Regenerative Voices, Elevating Stories, Activating Change podcast. Thanks for joining us today. The Regenerative Voices Elevating Stories Activating Change podcast series is produced by At the Epicenter, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. Make a tax deductible donation or sign up as a monthly supporter by visiting at theepicenter.com/donate. Support packages start at $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. To become a podcast sponsor, visit at theepicenter.com slash contact to let us know of your interest. If you found this podcast episode insightful and meaningful, please pass it on by sharing it with a friend or colleague who will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in, for your support, and for activating change.